Welcome to OutDrive, folks. I'm your host, Cliff Callis, and each week I'm bringing you actionable marketing insights you can apply to reach, connect with, and convert rural American consumers. OutDrive is powered by Callis, a full-service advertising agency with a focus on marketing rural America. Callis offers a wide range of integrated marketing services, including website development, search engine marketing, social media, video, and digital. We develop strategic and creative campaigns to build your brand and your business. And you can learn more about us at ecalis.com. Now join me in the front seat as we head out on the road to success. Let's go. Hey folks, welcome to OutDrive. We've got another great story to share with you today about life and work in rural America. You know, out here in the country, we sometimes get a bad rap that we're behind the curve in the use of technology and innovation. But honestly, nothing could be further from the truth. Our guest today is proof of that. Taylor Moreland is the founder and owner of a Missouri company called Agri Spray Drones that manufactures and markets drones for agricultural applications. Taylor and his team believe in empowering rural America with new opportunities, and they are building a company with products to do just that. Listen in to hear Taylor's story about starting their business and how they're not only making innovative products for the ag industry, but marketing them in innovative ways as well. Welcome to OutDrive, Taylor. Hey, Cliff. Thanks for having me. Well, you're welcome. I've been looking forward to visiting, learning more about the AgriSpray drones and about how you got started in business and hear about some of your maybe successes and failures over the years that you've been in business because every business has those, but before we get into that, let's talk just a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, about myself. So I would describe myself as it relates to this podcast as definitely a rural American, a rural, rural Missourian. Grew up on a dairy farm, Western Missouri, four brothers. So farm background my entire life, worked on the farm, bucking hay bales, milking cows. And so ag's always been a big part of my life. And I wanted to pursue ag as a career, obviously, but of course, with having three other brothers, not everybody can go back to family farm. So I went to University of Missouri and studied ag business. I worked for a local farmer while I did that and took over for a pioneer dealership after college. And now my wife and I reside in Centralia, Missouri, along with our two kids. And we have a business, Agri Spray Drones, where we sell spray drones. We do lots of different stuff with that. And we also have a nonprofit we run as well called Frog Mobility, where we actually make mobility devices for children with disabilities. What got you into that? So my oldest son, Brody, he is six now, just turned six. And he was born with spina bifida, spinal cord atrophy. So he's paralyzed from the chest down. And when he was about a year and a half, he obviously couldn't crawl around. And I really wanted him to be able to crawl around. And so I started working on uh, something, a device, mobility device to get him to be able to move around the house. I've always been a tinkerer. You know, my dad was on the farm growing up, was always building things. I was helping him. And so, you know, we, we learned if nothing exists, you build it, uh, you make it for yourself. And so I made something for him that we called the frog and it just, you know, the name kind of just you know, looked like a frog, I guess, at the time. And it turned out it worked great for him. It also worked great for a lot of other kids, young, young kids. We're talking um, a year, year, year and a half, two years old, where nothing really existed for them. They had no mobility below the waist. They couldn't get around the house. They couldn't crawl. It's a really pivotal stage in a child's development. And mobility is important for, for that growth. And so we decided, hey, you know what, let's, let's make this for other kids. Let's start a nonprofit. Let's, let's do this as easily for the parents as we can. So what we do is we actually take volunteers and I do all the design work. We make two different devices, a little wheelchair and a little crawling device, the frog, and have volunteers help us build it. And then we send it to people all over the world, kids all over the world. That is awesome. That is awesome. Congratulations on that. I mean, that's, uh, that's remarkable, really. Is that how the idea of the Agri Spray Drone came about? If something doesn't exist, you make it? Exactly. So I've been a bit of a problem solver most of my life, I guess. I just really enjoy yeah, building things, making things, solving problems. And agri-spray drones really came about. So I, as I was a Pioneer dealer, 
I also sold crop protection products, fungicides, herbicides to farmers. And with fungicides on corn, they need to be applied a lot of times whenever it's tasseling and the corn's 10 feet tall. And so you have to use airplane or helicopter. And what ends up happening is the farmer would, they would call me and they would say, hey, I need fungicide on my corn. Can I buy that from you? And then can you also find somebody to apply it? Can you find somebody with an airplane or helicopter to apply this for me? So I was the middleman and it was a terrible position to be in because I was at the mercy of the applicator. I would tell the farmer one thing, the applicator would do a different, different, different thing. And so I thought, wouldn't it be great if the farmer could do this themselves? Wouldn't it be great if the farmer had a tool to aerial apply their own products? Or wouldn't it be great if somebody local had a small business with a drone and they could aerial apply 10,000 acres or so for the community and I could just work with them? That'd be perfect. And so it looked like drones were the answer. Tell us about the, you've been in business since 2019, is that right? Correct. Agri-spray drones, yeah, started in, uh, we found, found it in 2020, but yeah, we started testing prior to that. Okay. So tell us about the ups and downs over the last three or four years. There's, it's been a learning curve. It's a, it's a continual learning curve in this industry, any new market, any business for that matter, but especially a, a new market with new technology that's constantly evolving, that has regulations behind it that you have to educate the end user on, there are a ton of challenges. And so our first big hurdle, I'm sure everybody listening can attest to this if you're running a business through COVID, that was our first big hurdle was on the logistics side, on the supply side. And starting out that way in 2020, beginning of 2020, that was a huge hurdle because a lot of our products come from overseas. They come from China, they come from Asia. So this logistics issue was is a real big hurdle. And then of course, FAA regulation. There are a ton of FAA regulations with drones. And whenever you are supplying this equipment to farmers who don't understand FAA regulations, it's a foreign language to them. The education piece has been a huge challenge for us on educating, not just about how to use the product, but also about the entire ecosystem around the product. This has to be a fairly sophisticated piece of equipment. Tell us how it actually operates. It is sophisticated. You're right. There's a lot of really, really cool technology that goes into it. But from the operator side, it's actually pretty easy. So if you want to take a drone and you have a hundred acre field, you want to apply fungicide on that with an aerial platform, a drone, a helicopter, anything like that, you're going to be using a two gallons per acre volume typically. And so the drone holds 10 gallons. And so what you have to do is you have to have a trailer set up that's got your product mixed up. It's got a generator to charge batteries. It's got a way to fill the drone, where to, a way to place to land the drone. So you set all that up first. And then when you get to the field, you can, you can map it there. You can map it beforehand, but you bring in a boundary. So if you looked at Google maps on your phone, you can actually just make a boundary. The screen just looks just like that. So you tap around the boundary of the field, you make a boundary, and then you just hit takeoff and the drone flies itself. And it sprays by itself and it comes back when it's empty. And so there's a lot of really cool technology, including some radars and pump controls, flow meters, there's gyroscopes, there's RTK, there's GPS precision. There's a bunch of stuff that enables it to do that. But from the operator perspective, it's really just as simple as mapping a boundary, pressing go, and then landing it and refilling it, changing the battery and pressing go again. And from an efficiency standpoint, you're looking at realistically with our, our newest drone, about 40 acres per hour which is pretty good in terms of a grower level, a farmer level of, of efficiency. So when you're marketing your product, selling your product to a potential buyer, how are you positioning it versus a helicopter versus a crop duster? What's better about this approach? Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't say that it's better on its entirety. Every piece of equipment in ag definitely has its fit. And so when we look at the aerial application industry, which is what you know, where drones fit in agriculture, the drone is going to be able to do a lot of those niche type fields, those smaller fields, fields with, with a high degree of topography change, fields that may have uh, wind turbines, fields that are surrounded by trees. Those fields, aerial applicators really can't do very well or can't do it all. And there are a lot of underserved markets across the U.S., especially across you know, the Midwest in the air application industry where the growers are really wanting air application, but they can't get it because they live in an area where 
nobody, there are no air applicators who go to go to that area to provide services. And so a drone can be deployed anywhere, large fields, small fields. It's all about scale, really. So it's really pretty situational based on a buyer's needs. It is. Yeah. And a drone does have some advantages in terms of product placement efficacy. So if you're putting on a fungicide, you really need to coat the entire plant as best as possible with that product. And a drone with uh, moving slower, moving lower to the crop canopy, moving with precision and autonomy and prop wash off of the propellers can, in a lot of situations, do that a bit better than what a helicopter or airplane can do. I'm not an early adopter, but I would think that for those people who are, it might have been a pretty easy sell getting started for some. Exactly. I think in this stage right now, even so we are essentially two years into sales. Our first drone sale was January, 2020. And I think even right now, it is still the early adopters, but we are beginning to see that change where it is becoming a bit more accepted amongst the growers and the, and the farmers and the individuals in agriculture who like to wait until technology is proven. And it, it is proving itself now, but yes, our market our end users, I should say, in ag, especially in row crop, are divided into two categories. You have farmers who are operating these, these drones on the farm themselves, providing their own application on their own farm. And then our biggest market segment right now are individuals who are buying a drone and offering a custom service, a for hire service to growers. And the reason that's our biggest market is because those that's younger generation, a lot of those those folks, they either grew up on a farm or grew up in ag, they understand the industry, but of course they don't farm because buying land and buying equipment is immense. It's it's out of reach, you know, for most people. But they want to work in production ag. And a drone is a great fit because the initial investment is very low. You're looking at fifty to sixty thousand dollars all in um, on the initial investment. And you're looking at an ROI of really a net, I should say, of $10 an acre whenever you can do, you know, 300 acres a day and you have a six week window to do that. That's pretty good. So what we started seeing, actually, this is really cool. This actually shaped our mission statement. We started seeing is some of these early adopters, they were individuals who wanted to return back to the family farm. They were working in the city or working somewhere that had good job opportunities because the family farm is in an area where there are no opportunities unless you are a farmer, but they couldn't return. There wasn't enough revenue on the farm to support another family. So what they did is they, they would buy a drone. They would work with their family and, their, and the family's neighbors to get business. And they would start custom application to bring in income. And they would also be able to have free time to help with planting season, help with harvest season and raise a family in rural America which is awesome to see that. And that just kept happening and happening and happening. We thought there's something to this. This technology is not just really cool for farmers. It's really cool for rural America in general, providing opportunities to rural America. So that's actually what our mission statement is now. It's empowering rural America with new opportunities. And we love doing it. That is a very cool story. Because I was going to ask you, the next question was going to be, so you're getting people that are starting a business and using this technology as a tool to grow that business and really a sole purpose, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. There has been countless businesses started by individuals using drones. That is very cool. So you've had sales for two years and you got your first sale January of 2020 and then COVID hit 60 days later. What are you thinking? Yeah. And actually I may have misspoke earlier. First sale actually came in January of 21. The testing that we started started in 2020, did a full year of testing. And so we missed some of the early COVID supply shortages, but what really hit us was the backlog of containers in California. All of our stuff comes in through the ports in containers. And so this was something, whenever we started sales in January, we were doing pre-orders because I did not have the capital to buy a full container of drones at that point in time. And so we did some pre-orders that we could show the bank something, obviously, that, hey, this this has traction. <laughs> um, uh, I need a loan. And so we did that. And then we worked with the manufacturer. We got an order placed for 30 units. And then we looked at the shipping cost, which was immense. And we thought, well, there goes half our margin. Because at that point in time, getting a container in the U.S. was very, very expensive. And then we looked at the lead time. 
And so we actually, our first few containers, our first one came through, we sent one through Vancouver. We sent one through Charleston. We sent one through New York. We were just hopping around all over the place, really scrambling, trying to get these things here as, as quick as possible. It was a challenge, but we made it through it. And luckily our first customers, the early adopters, they're on the leading edge, sometimes the bleeding edge. So they're used to delays and things like that when it comes to new technology. They were pretty forgiving. Yeah. So all of your sales are really direct, whether they be to farmers or individuals who have created commercial operations. So do you have other people in the distribution channels that are coming to you now asking you to either make something similar for them or give them the opportunity to market your drones? Yes, we do. And that is our next route to market strategy is setting up a network of resellers and dealers. We do have dealers right now, but the reason that I started selling drones, not just operating drones, because originally I was just going to start operating drones, providing the service, is because we couldn't find another supplier in the U.S. that understood agriculture. They could sell you a drone, they could ride you a drone, but they couldn't tell you how to use it, and they couldn't tell you anything about uh, the efficacy with different products, things like that, and they couldn't really speak the language of our end users who are farmers. And so... That's why we started selling. We do that very, very well. So most of our sales are still direct to the end user. But as this industry is developing, the success that we have had has helped a lot of our competitors and made people aware of the usefulness of this technology, the ROI of the technology. And so now other suppliers are starting to pop up. And so what we now realize is not just that, but it's also becoming, like I said, going from the early adopters to a more ubiquitous product that needs local support. And so for that reason, yes, we are actually beginning to launch a very aggressive campaign to attract dealers and resellers. And we hope to have between 30 and 40 by the end of this year. Wow. Good luck with that. I think you're, you're on the right track. So I know when I started doing a little research, to prepare for the podcast, I started getting served up some ads. I saw some retargeting, some other things. Talk a little bit about some of the strategies you've used to connect with your customers and potential customers. Right. So in terms of marketing, so content, we focus a lot on content. And what type of content? Well, it's educational primarily. We focus a lot on informing folks who don't know anything about this technology, providing them with the pieces of the puzzle to kind of put it together and make it make sense for them. And then we do a lot of educational content for farmers who they have a particular problem. Here's how a drone can address that problem. So we do a ton of videos, YouTube videos. And then of course, through, through advertising, of course, we're using Google ads and we do a lot of trade shows. We try to do some earned media courses as well. And farmers still read magazines. So we try to do magazines and all being redirected back to our video content and all being radio content and then website, of course, because that has information on there as well. So if that kind of explains what we do. Yeah. <laughs> it does. Well, you so. seem very astute at the marketing side of your business. Is that something that you've just learned over the years? Yeah, I guess. You know, I went to school for ag business. I took ag markets. Remember that? That was a terrible class, but that was not marketing. <laughs> that, that was that was corn and soybean prices and stuff like that. So I really haven't had any official you know, marketing training. For me, it's just do what makes sense. All right. And, you know, bootstrapping a company like this, you have to. You know, we didn't take outside investment. I don't necessarily have a partner in this. This has just been, you know, grassroots, you know, bootstrapped kind of a deal. And so a lot of it, I had to just teach myself, you know, how do I use Google ads? How do I use Facebook ads? How do I find somebody to build a website for me? What's YouTube all about? And do people actually watch these videos about drones? You know, but yeah, a lot of it's just been trial and error. You can learn anything that you want from YouTube and Google, I found. And so if you want to learn how to do something with marketing, you can learn it. We do have a marketing team, though. We've got a few folks now. We're building larger and larger marketing team. 
who do kind of the nitty gritty kind of stuff that I don't understand. And so they are pivotal. It's been great having those folks on the team. You know, it's kind of like me with agronomy and with agriculture. If you're trying to do something as a grower and trying to figure out how to do it, well, I can explain it very, very quickly, very easily. And I can point in the right direction and tell you who to talk to, all that kind of stuff. And on the marketing side, I know what I want to do, but it's how the heck are we going to do that? And so that's where our marketing team really helps a lot. Well, you seem like a natural. And from an outsider's perspective, looking at what you've been doing, I think you've been doing a very effective job of it. And I congratulate you on that. So you mentioned, and maybe we'll get into this a little bit later, but let me just go ahead and ask about it since I'm thinking about it. You mentioned other uses for your drones. What's out ahead that you can talk about? What's out there that you might get into? Yeah, so up to this point, really, you know, over the past two years or so, it's just been spray drones. We've had one flagship product every year, and it's been our biggest drone. And that's what we sell. You know, 95% of our sales are that product and it, its components, essentially. And majority, I would say 60 to 75% of those sales are going to where corn is grown for fungicide. So there, there are fungicide machines on, on corn. And it makes sense. It's a very natural fit for the product. But... When you look at ag, so we are ag first company. We look to solve problems in ag. So that's what we're doing right now is we're looking at a ton of other markets, a ton of other crops. Uh, we're doing lots of different testing. So I'll give you a list of a few things that we think are going to be big growth for us. And you look at crops like cranberries, forestry, greenhouse painting is incredible. Shading, shade painting with drones. There's cotton defoliation right now. It looks to be very effective done with the drone. Wetland management. And conservation right of management, pasture looks to be very big. And then there's some stuff on the specialty crops, orchards and vineyards, where drones may not actually be the best fit for the application of products on those crops. And so we're actually testing right now some autonomous ground vehicles that are able to do that very effectively. So those are all outstanding uses. What's the vision for your company? I mean, you're only three or four years old, having a lot of success, lots of ideas for where you can take this. What's your long-term vision, Taylor? So again, the underpinning of everything that we do really does boil back to our, our mission statement, empowering rural America opportunities. And it's really, really cool to see that. And so I want to make sure that wherever we go, whatever we do, that that stays true to that mission statement through the technology that we provide. And so we're going to keep providing new technology and drones are still going to be a flagship, obviously, of our business model. I do see opportunity to start providing other products and services that will empower individuals and really bring those opportunities to folks across America uh, to start their own businesses, providing services in those areas. And then in terms of you know scale and how we're going to accomplish that, right now with the industry growing and other people wanting to get into it, kind of where we're at on you know working with the customers, providing the technology, yes, we are going to be expanding pretty heavily with partners and with resellers. And we are going to basically be taking a step back from the direct sales in a lot of the areas that we're involved in and become more of a distributor so that we can then spend more time internally focusing on R&D, on testing new products and providing new solutions. That's exciting. So let's just take a moment. If somebody's listening today and they either have a direct need for their fields or they love the idea of starting their own business and doing this from a commercial standpoint or they're interested in partnering with you at some point along the distribution channel, how would they get a hold of you? What would you like for them to do? Right. So first off, I would recommend that you learn as much as you can about this technology. You know, whenever you first learn that the spray drones actually exist, instantly about a hundred questions pop into your head. And so check us out on YouTube. We answer a lot of questions on there. That'll really help you wrap your head around this technology. Agri spray drones. We are at Agri spray drones, A-G-R-I spray drones on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Those are our learning resources there and agrispraydrones.com as our website and reach out to us through those channels. I love talking to folks who want to do this kind of stuff. So you'll get one of the office gals on the phone, but if you ask for Taylor, then I'll get a hold of you. I think you're going to be getting some calls, Taylor. 
Well, I love the passion that you bring to your business. Was it always a foregone conclusion that you were going to stay in agriculture growing up? No, it wasn't. I guess I should probably say through, you know, high school and whatnot, whenever people are trying to figure out what they're going to do with the rest of their life, everybody asks you, well, what are you going to do? You have no idea. You know, I have no idea what I was going to do. I didn't know I was going to go to college until my ag teacher told me that you're going to go to college and uh, you're going to go here and you're going to major in this because that's what I did. I said, no, okay, sounds good to me. <laughs> but I think everybody's comfortable with what they're used to. And I was used to ag and you know, very involved in ag all my life. And I love it. I really love it. And I think America has a very, very strong ag industry, a growing ag industry. And so there's tons of opportunities for individuals in agriculture here. Yeah, there are. You went to Mizzou. Probably not a better ag school in the country, although I guess if you grow up in another agrarian state, they might argue with you, but <laughs> sure. I'm sure that you felt like that the education that you took away from the university prepared you pretty well for what you're doing today. It sort of did, yes, but I would say that that was maybe 50% of it. What was great about going to ag college and learning everything on the business side and the ag side was yes, I got some knowledge from that, of course, that I that I still use today, but I got connections with, you know, other folks who had similar backgrounds, with similar mindset, similar drive and motivations. That helped immensely with building that network. I would say majority of what I use and do and have learned came from after school. Nothing beats hands-on learning. I'm a firm believer in that. Nothing beats teaching yourself how to do something. If you've got an idea and you've got a passion and you know you want to do something, figuring out how to do it on your own, figuring out who to contact, teach you how to do that. That's a great way to learn because you're, you're super motivated to do it. That's excellent insight for our audience, Taylor. So how'd you end up in Centralia? So I, yeah, I grew up in Western Missouri and actually so did my wife, just South of Kansas City. We met in college, but yeah, I worked for a farmer through college to help pay the bills, to help pay tuition. I worked for a farm right around Columbia, Missouri, in the Centralia area. And I was looking for a job after graduation. And his wife sold Pioneer Seed. She was looking to retire from that. And so the stars kind of aligned. And I took over her small business and moved to Centralia then. I made a promise to my wife because she wanted to always wanted to move back home. You know, I made a promise to her that we would do that within, you know, five years after graduation. It's been 10 now, but we are moving back this year, our hometown. Congratulations. Well, I was going to ask you, do you ever get back to the country to farm with your family? I will very soon. Good for you. I'll be in a combine this fall. <laughs> Can't wait, probably. That's right. Hey, I've really enjoyed visiting. You know, we have very similar values and approaches to business because, you know, with our not only in our advertising agency, but in our podcast, you know, it's all about educating people about rural America. And I, and I know you do too, believe we have it pretty good out here and think there's a lot of other people who would appreciate what we have as well. But when I mention the words rural America, what kind of thoughts and images come to mind for you? Well, it's, it's just life in general because it's where I live. So, <laughs> um, I don't know how to, how to describe it, you know, being able to have space, raise a family with values, like you said, hard work, teaching, you know, your family, the value of hard work and you know, that can be done anywhere. But I think especially, you know, when you grow up in, in rural America, there's a lot of things that you have to do, especially when you grow up on a farm as well, that just have to be done. And you don't ask questions, you just do it. And then you reap the rewards essentially from that. That's kind of what comes to mind anyways. That's what it was when I was growing up anyways. <laughs> We're right on the same page there. Yeah, I've really enjoyed visiting with you today. You have had an amazing amount of insight to provide for our audience. And I think they're going to be excited to hear about the Agri Spray drones if they haven't already. So hopefully your, your website's going to get a bunch of new activity and you know good things happen from that. What else would you like to share with our audience today that you think they might find interesting or maybe inspiring? Sure. This is usually the time in the podcast that I mentioned Frog Mobility, our, our nonprofit, because I always like to plug that. <laughs> Please do. Yeah. So I guess when we look on the ag side, on the drone side first, you know, I think this was an industry that was up until just a few years ago thought of as, well, that's never going to happen. It's oversold and, you know, it's not useful. 
but I think it is here to stay. I mean, the market on ag drones, this technology is going to grow immensely over the next few years. And we're going to see so many changes that are in so many new entrants, I believe, too, that that's, that's going to happen. So it's an exciting time to get involved. Exciting time to get involved, yes. And here's my curveball question that since it's baseball season, I always like to throw one out there that just kind of comes to mind. So you've got this successful product. It's high tech. There's lots of opportunities ahead. You're growing. Business is growing. You're adding new employees. What kind of things keep you up at night? Well, I would say so business strategy ever evolving. And thankfully, we are able to pivot quickly and change our strategies quickly. But it is those decisions that do kind of keep me up at night. I'm a bit of a night owl anyway. So I mean, I'm just keeping myself up at night working in general. But you know, the things I think about are definitely those pivotal big decisions where we know, okay, we need to make a change because the industry is changing. And this has happened, I mean, I can't tell you how many times this has happened just over the past two years where we've had to make a big change in how we interact with our customers or how we interact with our partners or, you know, a pricing structure change or something like that. And those are the kinds of things that keep me up at night. Uncertainty of those big decisions is, I'm sure everybody has that experience. But you're thinking about the right things. Mm -hmm. Taylor, thanks for being with us. I've really enjoyed visiting with you and getting to know you. I wish you all the luck in the world for all your business endeavors and family as well. Oh, thank you. Folks, thanks for listening to OutDrive. I hope you've enjoyed our visit today with Taylor Moreland, founder and owner of Agra Spray Drones and Frog Mobility. Come back again next week, and I'll take you down the roads of rural America, where it's heaven on earth. Thanks for taking a ride with us on OutDrive. This episode is complete, so head on over to eCalus.com for more insight. You can apply to help drive your business growth. And be sure to sign up for our free monthly e-letter, OutThink, for even more helpful content about marketing to rural America. Have a great day, and keep on driving.